Hello everybody. I hope wherever you're watching us from you are having a great time. This is Afri Post and welcome to today's video. Now, while we have always been told about the story of slavery in Africa, many of people living today do not really have a direct link with what slavery meant and therefore their lived experiences may not really mirror what happened during the slavery period. That is, we may not really know what our forefathers went through during this time and therefore some of us may feel quite detached from these kind of heinous activities that were done to us by white people. And I think it is a discussion that I like sometimes to bring up so that we get to understand who we are, we get to understand our history, and we also understand where we are headed. Now, currently there is a discussion going on in South Africa, and this discussion is very, very good for me because it tries to look into the societal issues affecting people and what really needs to be done to ensure that the society as it is today gets to be equal and people who have gone through a lot of challenges get to be compensated or even get their rightful share of what they should get within their country. For our starters, you must know that South Africa is the country in Africa with the highest population of whites. In fact, it is estimated that close to 9% of its population are whites. And this can be equated to close to 4.6 million people. So this is a substantial number within that country. We know that Africa is mostly black people. But then we have whites who are also Africans in South Africa. So the question has been, we are seeing that South Africans are complaining that most of the means of production are owned by white people. Yet blacks feel that they are the real owners of South Africa the real owners of the land in South Africa, and therefore they should be prioritized, or even the society should prioritize them in terms of giving them what they deserve instead of accumulating the much needed resources in the hands of few white people and leaving millions of black people in abject poverty. Here is a discussion that was aired in the big debate where a population of both white and black South Africans came together to really discuss this issue deeply. And I like the kind of sentiments that were discussed here. So let's watch this, then come back and talk about this issue further. Under white supremacy right now. And we, we, we skip away of the violence of white supremacy because we, we talk about the township, we talk about poverty as, as things that are, that, are, that are, it's just irrelevant. That lady's story is so powerful because it's the story of my mother, it's my story, it's, it's the story of every black person in this room who has been dispossessed, who lives under violence every day in this country. So I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't want you to live in ways that, that, that you want to give back the land because I want to take back the land because for me, psychologically, it's very important that I take back the land. You don't give it back to me because it was taken back forcefully under, under colonialism. So I want to decolonize this country. And maybe if it means that the, an army of black people in this country take arms in order to do that, then maybe it needs to happen. But I'm tired of these, I'm tired of these debates. But when you've taken the land back, when you've taken the land back, make sure you give it to the rightful owners in terms of the truth. Give it to the Koi and the Sun people there. Yes. They are the rightful owners. If you want to take back the land, give it to the rightful owners. But you see, the problem is this. So are you saying that black people are also not the rightful owners of this land? If the black people are the rightful owners, where did they get the land? Where is that what you're saying? No, no, no. History is much more complicated than that. Much more complicated. And we can go and have a look at that. But it's a myth. It's a myth to just claim that everything belonged to this and nobody, nothing belonged to that. It's a myth. If people start talking about war, we are in a very, very dangerous situation. It's very easy to incite violence. You don't know what you're talking about, and I would suggest that we all move away from that. Wait, 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 wait a second. Hold on a that. second. And luckily, luckily I know that the majority of people in this country from different communities are not interested in violence, they are not interested in conflict and war. Those are side elements that should not be allowed to destroy the fabric of social cohesion in this country. All right, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. No social cohesion. Um, if you want my land, you can come and take it right now. I've never owned any land anywhere, ever. I'd like to make a proposal though. Right? In, in all these debates, a, lo a lot of people forget Right, that our government actually owns almost half of all the land in no, South Africa. No, that's not true. Don't lie. Don't lie. At national, at national, don't lie. Don't lie. At You're lying. 
You're lying. At national and You're provincial level, lying. it's 24 percent, and at, at at municipal level, we don't really know, but You're it's estimated lying. by 25 percent. All right, let's let him finish. Also, also, also the government <laughs> owns a lot of national assets in terms of state-owned enterprises, right? And a lot. It's not only the big guys. No? That, why would the government need to own a diamond mine? Right? Now, the government could, in uh, very short order, right, make a huge dent in economic inequality. I'm not saying it's going to solve all the problems, right, but make a huge difference right, by giving that back to the people. Right? It used to belong to the apartheid government, now it belongs to the ANC government. Right? Go, go along with the Freedom Charter. Say, let the people own these national assets. Right? They did that with telecom. They did that with telecom to an extent. All right. Okay. <laughs> Henny, are we destined for war? I don't think we should wish for war. I think, Master Chaba, we speak easily about it, and I understand our frustration, but I think we must, in respecting those who fought for our freedom and who have fallen, we shouldn't wish this thing back upon us. But equally, my, equally must, and it is our freedom for all of us and a responsibility to act. And I, and I say equally for white people to act responsibly. And while we talk about the land issue, and it is fundamental, I think... Equally, we have to talk about our economy. We have to say every year about 300 billion rand leaves this, this country in capital that very wealthy people own, which they move offshore. It's a fundamentally unpatriotic act that happens of undermining the future of this country. It's that which we need to equally hold responsible to say to those who have money that we are going to look at ways in which that money must be reinvested in the future of all of our people. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break. When we return, the final word from our audience and our panel. This is The Big Debate. <laughs> Welcome back to The Big Debate on racism, inequality and white privilege. South Africa is certainly more divided than ever. What will it take to create a real non-racist society. I, I think it's very important for us not to individualize this issue because I do think that, that one, uh, we are already in an incredibly um, polarized um, uh, condition at the moment over the past few, that's been rising over the past few years. So the thing is, we are in a situation of contestation. Let's keep up that political contestation around ideas. What are the best models? What are the, the best ways to dismantle whiteness, dismantle white privilege, and, and, and look at, the, and, and, but to throw out the constitution in the process, to say we need a war to, 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 to fix this, I think is, is actually um, uh, not, not, um, not actually giving credence to the lives that were lost, to the very hard battles that were fought, I think we need to understand that there is no vehicle in this country that is being used to drive social cohesion. Uh, apartheid fell after the Klerk had a whites-only referendum, after the sports movement was crippled in this country. I think we need to look at a vehicle that can drive us forward. Roads must fall indeed, but there's lots of other things that need to fall along with it. When land was violently taken from black people, it was taken as a resource to, to life, to access to life. When 35,000 families own 80% of the land in South Africa, they own the economy of South Africa. The struggle towards um, building a new country that is black because South Africa is first and foremost a black country that should portray African values. That struggle should only be led by black people. I incidentally don't share the idea that the problem that we're dealing with here is whiteness. It's capitalism. The deal that was signed uh, at Codessa was calculated to preserve the ownership of the commanding heights of the economy, the banks, the mines, the big commercial farms and so forth, in the hands of the capitalist class. The basis of that agreement was that ways would be opened for the aspirant black elite represented by the ANC to be given some crumbs in the form of BEE, as I think Mwilet Simbeki in his book about, about the subject has so eloquently explained. I'm not interested, by the way, in a society in which we are ruled by black billionaires instead of white billionaires. 
We do not want any kind of billionaires at all so that the wealth of this country is owned and controlled by the overwhelming majority. We don't want, inequ we don't want equality of poverty. What we want is equality of wealth. Steve Biko questioned whether there would be space for all of us at the rendezvous of victory. And the thing is that there can be space for all of us, but the onus is on white South Africans to recognize their unearned privilege, to realize that white racism is self-destructive, and to commit themselves to use the power they have to advance transformation. It's a decision that white South Africans have to make, and unless they make the right decision, they are endangering themselves, and there's no one else to blame. Uh, it's been very disturbing to hear comments like, how disempowered am I really if I'm able to go to an institution of higher learning? Firstly, you do not know the cost at, that which, at which that came. Black kids have to go and prove how poor they are just to get a loan from NASFAS, and then you are not poor enough. So you still can't pay your loans, you need to, so that was very disturbing. And secondly, you cannot continue to tell us that education is the key and not the land when black graduates are standing on the street corners with signs. You're watching The Big Debate. When we come back, closing statements from our panel. Welcome back to The Big Debate. I'm Masa Chabandlovo. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. And now, let's get a final word from our panel. I'm an optimist, I'm a positive person, and I think that we still have wonderful things to achieve in South Africa. But we have to celebrate our diversity. Together we can make a success of this country. I'm committed to do so, and I think the majority of our people will do the same. <laughs> Lovelyn. I think that in as much as the systems of oppression have, benefit pe have benefited people at a group level, I think that at a group level people have a responsibility of undoing those systems. And so when people say, what must white people do to undo their white privilege, it needs to be a very deliberate daily action. It means paying your workers better, it means respecting black people, it means not talking down to black people, it means, you know, allowing and even, you know, reducing the amount of space you take so that other black people can just feel human and dignified in a space. Mm. It has to be deliberate and I think this conversation is not going to end until it's deliberate and until white people are as uncomfortable in their own skin as black South Africans have been. Sarah. I really just want to echo those statements that it's an active process of working towards disrupting whiteness, to, of working towards decolonization, um, and that no white South African should feel comfortable in their skin. I mean, who cares what I think, really? I think that the most important decisions in this country are not mine to make, and that the sooner white South Africans realize this is a black country, the better. I believe, as I said, inequality is unacceptable, must be changed. I think racism must be rooted out. I think intolerance, as I've seen in this debate, must also be rooted out. And I do think that if we take the Constitution and we take the Freedom Charter, that the land belongs to everyone who lives in it, white and black, we can go forward. Thank you. All right. The thing is, if you antagonize d different groups and different races, right, this is only going to go one way and that's going to end up in war. Right? Now, there, there are solutions, there are ways of uh, dealing with this, and the government can make a huge dent in inequality simply by uh, its own policy towards state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. towards state-owned land, uh, and how, for that matter, it regulates business. Thank you. We have seen the war in Syria, what it does, and I strongly discourage those who think it will solve the problems of South Africa by us fighting amongst a civil law amongst us South Africans. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the discussions around not inciting war uh, are, very, are, are based on an, an not understanding um, how uh, the concentration camps, currently known as townships, are actually war zones. There's an urgency 
uh, for for black people to be able to breathe in their own country, in their own land. Mm -hmm. That uh, and and that's a necessary process that needs to happen. And and decolonization uh, on a structural level, the economy, education, uh, medicine, everything needs to happen in this country. And and and. You know, if foundations like the Declack Foundation, by criminalizing uh, young people who are angry, who can't breathe, who are in so much pain, in a, in a violent system, is only just, as this gentleman behind me had said, is just speeding up that process. Thank you. Abraham? Land restitution is important. Uh, economic redress is important. Uh, you can't just say, as long as you overthrow capitalism, then you live. Uh, you know, attain total societal transformation. That level of reductionism actually makes nonsense of a very complex uh, project that, that, that you're involved in. That's not cool. What, what potentially makes nonsense of our democratic project must be the concentration of power in the hands of small groups of people. Ultimately, I think that is what the fight against racism is about. And equally, what the fight against the ownership of the economy in the hands of very few people is about. So I think for us to be able to look at a future as a country, it has to be to dealing with uh, economic inequality and, and dealing with the power that very, very few people have in our country uh, and the dispossession that that results in. Thank you, Henny. I think it is very important to keep on with this debate and to keep it honest and frank. So, um, yeah, so everybody should be heard and everybody's views should be respected. I strongly believe that education is a crisis in this country and that will help to dissolve inequality. So there is 80% of schools in South Africa is dysfunctional and that is um, unacceptable. Thank you very much. Well, it seems racism is not just about attitudes. It's also about the power to harm other people's lives. And in South Africa today, millions of black people's lives are damaged by an economy and a society which is rigged in favor of the rich. And the richest South Africans are still mostly white. Wow, what a discussion. I think the discussion there is quite interesting in terms of looking at where all people who are in that panel come from. If you look at the whites, they try to claim that they are entitled to whatever they own. However, if you look at the blacks in the discussion, they are kind of saying that whites have taken advantage of the system and the white supremacy that has pro been promoted in South Africa has ensured that most of the resources remain domiciled among white people. And therefore, even as the host has said, much of the wealth that is held by 10% of the population is owned by predominantly white people. And therefore, blacks who form over 80% of the population in South Africa feel disenfranchised. And they think that there is these people who came to Africa, came to our country, took our land, and they are also making us poor within our country. So it's a very, very serious discussion that must be looked into deeply. Now, I got an article that I want us to share here. It's the UN article that was talking about the inequalities in South Africa. And it really highlighted some of the pertinent issues that have been highlighted, that have been mentioned in the discussion that you just watched. So I'll read. 30 years since the end of apartheid, South Africa still grapples with its legacy. Unequal access to education, unequal pay, segregated communities, and massive economic disparities persist. Much of it is reinforced by existing institutions and attitudes. How is it that racism and its accompanying discrimination continues to hold such a sway in this majorly black populated and a black governed nation. Racism has deep roots in the economic, spatial and societal fabric of, its, of this country. It reflects the legacy of oppression and subjugation from apartheid and colonialism. While progress has been made to eliminate the scourge of racism, it requires everyone to do their part for it to be eliminated. Dismantling such entrenched racist and discriminatory systems require commitment, leadership, dialogue, and advocacy to put in place anti-racist policies that implement human rights norms and provide a framework to help address and rectify these injustices and promote inequality. So from this article alone, you're able to see that even the United Nations can admit that racist activities and tendencies still remain entrenched in South Africa. 
there are institutions that were formed by the apartheid government and these institutions has carried on these attitudes and prejudices against black people and therefore this is why you find in that video most blacks are complaining about the discrimination that they continue to face why is it that they are not able to access land in a country that is rightfully theirs there are people who came who are whites who are not originally africans for that matter but because of that magnanimity that africans have that they welcomed them and allowed them to settle even after the end of apartheid they have gone ahead to really take up much resources that do not belong to the whites so i think here there is a sense in which we need a serious discussion and that is why from the onset i said this discussion that is going on in south africa is something that is highly welcomed it is something that i like because it is able to open up things that were hidden away from people and then once candid discussions are held people are going to find solutions from these discussions and have a better strategy through which they can enjoy and even approach the challenges that they are going through the scars of apartheid run deep leaving a legacy of segregation discrimination and inequality this is evidenced by the stark economic disparity in the country a 2022 world bank report in inequality in south africa gave south africa the unfortunate distinction of being the most unequal country in the world in 2022 a world bank report showed that south africa remains the most unequal country in the world and i want to give it to you deeper so that you get to understand it the report stated that 80% of the country's wealth was in the hands of 10% of the population and it is the black population who factor the most into the poorest category the report places the blame for the income disparities directly on race so this tells you where these challenges lie 10% of the population own the entire wealth that is held in south africa and majority of those who are categorized as being poor are black people here i think if you look at the discussion that i've just played for you most of these people who are black can be declared as being justified to claim the claims that they have because they are finding themselves black people who are real africans not getting opportunity to really have means of production and control this means of production huge chunks of lands are held by individuals and most of these individuals are white how on earth does a person who is a settler get more authority and control of resources in a country more than even the original inhabitants of that country so i think this is a discussion that is timely and it must be held and these discussions must continue the evil genius of apartheid was the segregation project as it allowed the government to not only separate people based on arbitrary categorizations but through this create material differences between the communities to reinforce the idea of actual racial differences the racial classification also encouraged the idea that the different groups needed to compete for basic human rights dignity and economic opportunities you are able to see these kind of challenges that are being highlighted the apartheid government didn't just give people categories they gave real life material meaning to those categories as long as those categories mean something in the world we still have work to do to undo apartheid to undo colonialism and to decolonize and this decolonization is what most of the speakers who are black in that clip talked about they are finding that colonization as people have claimed that ended in africa still happens in south africa there is a sense in which major part of the government or even natural resources are still controlled by the colonizers who are the whites and look at what has happened we have seen a government that is called the government of national unity that was formed the other day and this gave da which is a majority white party some chance to really form a government many black people who are in south africa are not in tandem with what the cyril ramaphosa's government was doing and that is something that has been discussed in different spaces and i guess there is a sense in which a solution will be arrived at and a real solution will be obtained to have 
better representation and equal opportunities for everybody without any consideration of racial differences that has always happened even after apartheid was even after apartheid was ended in south africa so from that discussion you are able to see that there is a lot of challenges that south africans continue to undergo this is because they did not have equal representation as it was and even the natural resources that they have were all in the hands of people who perpetrated apartheid upon them it is time for these kind of discussions to happen and i think one day just one day africans will rise and the black people will be respected and that's the end of the video if you like such kind of videos please don't forget to subscribe to our channel like this video and also share also remember to give us your opinion down in the comment section so that we may also understand your perspective about the topic thank you may the good lord bless you goodbye